old-wing motorcycle. He could hear the rumble of a diesel engine. Printed on the side of the loco, in old-fashioned gold flake letters, was the Helen Rivington. Town patroness, Dan supposed. Somewhere in Fraser, there was probably a street named after her, too. He stood where he was for a bit, although the sun had gone back in and the day had grown cold enough for him to see his breath. As a kid, he'd always wanted an electric train set and had never had one. Yonder in Teeny Town was a jumbo version kids of all ages could love. He shifted his duffel bag to his other shoulder and crossed the street. Hearing Tony again and seeing him was unsettling, but right now he was glad he'd stopped here. Maybe this really was the place he'd been looking for, the one where he'd finally find a way to write his dangerously tipped life. You take yourself with you wherever you go. He pushed the thought into a mental closet. It was a thing he was good at. There was all sorts of stuff in that closet. Four. A cowling surrounded the locomotive on both sides, but he spied a footstool standing beneath one low eave of the teeny town station, carried it over and stood on it. The driver's cockpit contained two sheepskin-covered bucket seats. It looked to Dan as if they had been scavenged from an old Detroit muscle car. The cockpit and controls also looked like modified Detroit stock, with the exception of an old-fashioned Z-shaped shifter jutting up from the floor. There was no shift pattern. The original knob had been replaced with a grinning skull wearing a bandana faded from red to pallid pink by years of gripping hands. The top half of the steering wheel had been cut off so that what remained looked like the steering yoke of a light plane. Painted in black on the dashboard, fading but legible, was Top Speed 40, Do Not Exceed. Like it? The voice came from directly behind him. Dan wheeled around, almost falling off the stool. A big weathered hand gripped his forearm, steadying him. It was a guy who looked to be in his late fifties or early sixties, wearing a padded denim jacket and a red-checked hunting cap with the ear flaps down. In his free hand was a tool kit with Property of Fraser Municipal Department, Dymo taped across the top. Hey, sorry, Dan said, stepping off the stool. I didn't mean to. It's all right. People stop to look all the time. Usually model train buffs. It's like a dream come true for them. We keep them away in the summer when the place is jumping and the river runs every hour or so. But this time of year, there's no we, just me. And I don't mind. He stuck out his hand. Billy Freeman, town maintenance crew. The river's my baby. Dan took the offered hand. Dan Torrance. Billy Freeman eyed the duffel. Just got off the bus, I imagine. Or are you riding your thumb? Bus, Dan said. What does this thing have for an engine? Well, now, that's interesting. Probably never heard of the Chevrolet Veraneo, did ya? He hadn't, but knew anyway. Because Freeman knew. Dan didn't think he'd had such a clear shine in years. It brought a ghost of delight that went back to earliest childhood before he had discovered how dangerous the shining could be. Brazilian suburban, wasn't it? Turbo Diesel. Freeman's bushy eyebrows shot up and he grinned. God damn right! Casey Kingsley, he's the boss, bought it at an auction last year. It's a corker. Pulls like a son of a bitch. The instrument panel's from a Suburban, too. The seats I put in myself. The shine was fading now, but Dan got one last thing. From a GTO judge. Freeman beamed. That's right. Found him in a junkyard over Sunapee Way. The shifter's a hi-hat from a 1961 Mac 9-speed. Nice, huh? You looking for work or just looking? Dan blinked at the sudden change of direction. Was he looking for work? He supposed he was. The hospice he'd passed on his amble up Cranmore Avenue would be the logical place to start, and he had an idea, didn't know if it was a shining or just ordinary intuition, that they'd be hiring, but he wasn't sure he wanted to go there just yet. Seeing Tony in the turret window had been unsettling. Also, Danny, you want to be a little bit farther down the road from your last drink before you show up there asking for a job application for. 
even if the only thing they got is running a buffer on a night shift. Dick Halloran's voice. Christ. Dan hadn't thought of Dick in a long time. Maybe not since Wilmington. With summer coming, a season for which Frazier most definitely had a reason, people would be hiring for all sorts of things. But if he had to choose between a Chili's at the local mall and Teeny Town, he definitely chose Teeny Town. He opened his mouth to answer Freeman's question, but Halloran spoke up again before he could. You closing in on the big 3 honey? You could be running out of chances. Meanwhile, Billy Freeman was looking at him with open and artless curiosity. Yes, he said. I'm looking for work. Working in Teeny Town wouldn't last long, you know. Once summer comes and the school's let out, Mr. Kingsley hires local. Eighteen to twenty-two, mostly. The select men expect it. Also, kids work cheap. He grinned, exposing holes where a couple of teeth had once resided. Still, there are worse places to make a buck. Outdoor work don't look so good today, but it won't be cold like this much longer. No, it wouldn't be. There were tarps over a lot of stuff on the common, but they'd be coming off soon, exposing the superstructure of small-town resort summer. Hot dog stands, ice cream booths, a circular something that looked to Dan like a merry-go-round. And there was the train, of course, the one with the teeny passenger cars and the big turbo-diesel engine. If he could stay off the sauce and prove trustworthy, Freeman, or the boss, Kingsley, might let him drive it a time or two. He'd like that. Farther down the line, when the municipal department hired the just-out-of-school local kids, there was always the hospice. If he decided to stay, that was. You better stay somewhere, Halloran said. This was Dan's day for hearing voices and seeing visions, it seemed. You better stay somewhere soon, or you won't be able to stay anywhere. He surprised himself by laughing. It sounds good to me, Mr. Freeman. It sounds really good. Five. Done any grounds maintenance? Billy Freeman asked. They were walking slowly along the flank of the train. The tops of the cars only came up to Dan's chest, making him feel like a giant. I can weed, plant, and paint. I know how to run a leaf blower and a chainsaw. I can fix small engines if the problem isn't too complicated. And I can manage a riding mower without running over any little kids. The train now, that I don't know about. You'd need to get cleared by Kingsley for that. Insurance and shit. Listen, if you get references, Mr. Kingsley won't hire without them. A few, mostly janitorial and hospital orderly stuff. Mr. Freeman, just Billy will do. Your train doesn't look like it could carry passengers, Billy. Where would they sit? Billy grinned. Wait here. See if you think this is as funny as I do. I never get tired of it. Freeman went back to the locomotive and leaned in. The engine, which had been idling lazily, began to rev and send up rhythmic jets of dark smoke. There was a hydraulic whine along the whole length of the Helen Rivington. Suddenly, the roofs of the passenger wagons and the yellow caboose, nine cars in all, began to rise. To Dan, it looked like the tops of nine identical convertibles all going up at the same time. He bent down to look in the windows and saw hard plastic seats running down the center of each car. Six in the passenger wagons and two in the caboose, fifty in all. When Billy came back, Dan was grinning. Your train must look very weird when it's full of passengers. Oh, yeah. People laugh their asses off and burn yay film taking pictures. Watch this. There was a steel-plated step at the end of each passenger car. Billy used one, walked down the aisle, and sat. A peculiar optical illusion took hold, making him look larger than life. He waved grandly to Dan, who could imagine fifty brob-ding Nagians dwarfing the train upon which they rode, pulling grandly out of Teeny Town Station. As Billy Freeman rose and stepped back down, Dan applauded. I'll bet you sell about a billion postcards between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Bet your ass, 
Billy rummaged in his coat pocket, brought out a battered pack of Duke cigarettes, a cut-rate brand Dan knew well, sold in bus stations and convenience stores all over America and held it out. Dan took one. Billy lit them up. I better enjoy it while I can, Billy said, looking at his cigarette. Smoking will be banned here before too many more years. Frazier Women's Club's already talking about it. Much of old biddies, if you ask me, but you know what they say. The hand that rocks the fucking cradle rules the fucking world. He jetted smoke from his nostrils. Not that most of them have rocked a cradle since Nixon was president. Or needed a Tampax, for that matter. Might not be the worst thing, Dan said. Kids copy what they see in their elders. He thought of his father. The only thing Jack Torrance had liked better than a drink, his mother had once said, not long before she died, was a dozen drinks. Of course, what Wendy had liked was her cigarettes, and they had killed her. Once upon a time, Dan had promised himself he'd never get going with that habit either. He had come to believe that life was a series of ironic ambushes. Billy Freeman looked at him. One eye squinted mostly shut. I got feelings about people sometimes, and I got one about you. He pronounced got as gut in the New England fashion. Had it even before you turned around and I saw your face. I think you might be the right guy for the spring cleaning I'm looking at between now and the end of May. That's how it feels to me, and I trust my feelings. Probably crazy. Dan didn't think it was crazy at all, and now he understood why he had heard Billy Freeman's thoughts so clearly and without even trying. He remembered something Dick Halloran had told him once. Dick, who had been his first adult friend. Lots of people have got a little of what I call a shining, but mostly it's just a twinkle, the kind of thing that lets them know what the DJ is going to play next on the radio or that the phone's going to ring pretty soon. Billy Freeman had that little twinkle, that gleam. I guess this Carrie Kingsley would be the one to talk to, huh? Casey, not Carrie. But yeah, he's the man. He's run municipal services in this town for 25 years. When would be a good time? Right about now, I should think, Billy pointed. Yonder pile of bricks across the streets the Frazier Municipal Building and town offices. Mr. Kingsley's in the basement end of the hall. You'll know you're there when you hear disco music coming down through the ceiling. There's a ladies' aerobics class in the gym every Tuesday and Thursday. All right, Dan said. That's just what I'm going to do. Got your references? Yes, Dan patted the duffel which he had leaned against Teeny Town Station. And you didn't write them yourself, nor nothing? Danny smiled. No, they're straight goods. Then go get them, Tiger. Okay. One other thing, Billy said as Dan started away. He's death on drinking. If you're a drinking man and he asks you, my advice is lie. Dan nodded and raised his hand to show he understood. That was a lie he had told before. Six. Judging by his vain, congested nose, Casey Kingsley had not always been death on drinking. He was a big man who didn't so much inhabit his small, cluttered office as wear it. Right now, he was rocked back in the chair behind his desk, going through Dan's references, which were neatly kept in a blue folder. The back of Kingsley's head almost touched the downstroke of a plain wooden cross hanging on the wall beside a framed photo of his family. In the picture... A younger, slimmer Kingsley posed with his wife and three bathing-suited kiddos on a beach somewhere. Through the ceiling, only slightly muted, came the sound of the village people singing YMCA, accompanied by the enthusiastic stomp of many feet. Dan imagined a gigantic centipede, one that had recently been to the local hairdresser and was wearing a bright red leotard about nine yards long. Uh-huh, Kingsley said. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Right, right, right. There was a glass jar filled with hard candies on the corner of his desk. Without looking up from Dan's thin sheaf of references, he took off the top, fished one out, and popped it into his mouth. Help yourself, he said. No, thank you, Dan said. A queer thought came to him. 
Once upon a time, his father had probably sat in a room like this, being interviewed for the position of caretaker at the Overlook Hotel. What had he been thinking? That he really needed a job? That it was his last chance? Maybe. Probably. But of course, Jack Torrance had had hostages to fortune. Dan did not. He could drift on for a while if this didn't work out, or try his luck at the hospice. But he liked the town common. He liked the train, which made adults of ordinary size look like Goliaths. He liked Teeny Town, which was absurd and cheerful, and somehow brave in its self-important small-town America way. And he liked Billy Freeman, who had a pinch of the shining and probably didn't even know it. Above them, YMCA was replaced by I Will Survive. As if he had just been waiting for a new tune, Kingsley slipped Dan's references back into the folder's pocket and passed them across the desk. He's going to turn me down. But after a day of accurate intuitions, this one was off the mark. These look fine, but it strikes me that you'd be a lot more comfortable working at Central New Hampshire Hospital or the hospice here in town. You might even qualify for home helpers. I see you've got a few medical and first aid qualifications. Know your way around a defibrillator, according to these. Heard of home helpers? Yes, and I thought about the hospice. Then I saw the town common and teeny town and the train. Kingsley grunted. Probably wouldn't mind taking a turn at the controls, would you? Dan lied without hesitation. No, sir, I don't think I'd care for that. To admit he'd like to sit in the scavenged GTO driver's seat and lay his hands on that cut-down steering wheel would almost certainly lead to a discussion of his driver's license, then to a further discussion of how he'd lost it and then to an invitation to leave Mr. Casey Kingsley's office forthwith. I'm more of a rake and lawnmower guy. More of a short-term employment guy, too, from the looks of this paperwork. I'll settle someplace soon. I've worked most of the wanderlust out of my system, I think. He wondered if that sounded as bullshitty to Kingsley as it did to him. Short-term's about all I can offer you, Kingsley said. Once the schools are out for the summer... Billy told me, if I decide to stay once summer comes, I'll try the hospice. In fact, I might put in an early application unless you'd rather I don't do that. I don't care either way. Kingsley looked at him curiously. Dying people don't bother you? Your mother died there, Danny thought. The shine wasn't gone after all, it seemed. It was hardly even hiding. You were holding her hand when she passed. Her name was Ellen. No, he said, then with no reason why, he added, we're all dying. The world's just a hospice with fresh air. A philosopher yet? Well, Mr. Torrance, I think I'm going to take you on. I trust Billy's judgment. He rarely makes a mistake about people. Just don't show up late, don't show up drunk, and don't show up with red eyes and smelling of weed. If you do any of those things, down the road you'll go, because the Rivington House won't have a thing to do with you. I'll make sure of it. Are we clear on that? Dan felt a throb of resentment, a vicious prick, but suppressed it. This was Kingsley's playing field and Kingsley's ball. Crystal. You can start tomorrow, if that suits. There are plenty of rooming houses in town. I'll make a call or two if you want. Can you stand paying ninety a week until your first paycheck comes in? Yes, thank you, Mr. Kingsley. Kingsley waved a hand. In the meantime, I'd recommend the Red Roof Inn. My ex-brother-in-law runs it. He'll give you a rate. We good? We are. It had all happened with remarkable speed, the way the last few pieces drop into a complicated thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. Dan told himself not to trust the feeling. Kingsley rose. He was a big man, and it was a slow process. Dan also got to his feet, and when Kingsley stuck his ham of a hand over the cluttered desk, Dan shook it. Now from overhead came the sound of KC and the Sunshine Band telling the world that's the way they liked it. Oh ho, uh-huh. I hate that boogie-down shit, Kingsley said. No, Danny thought. You don't. 
It reminds you of your daughter, the one who doesn't come around much anymore because she still hasn't forgiven you. You all right? Kingsley asked. You look a little pale. Just tired. It was a long bus ride. The shining was back and strong. The question was, why now? Seven. Three days into the job, ones Dan spent painting the bandstand and blowing last fall's dead leaves off the common, Kingsley ambled across Cranmore Avenue and told him he had a room on Elliott Street if he wanted it. Private bathroom part of the deal, tub and shower, eighty-five a week. Dan wanted it. Go on over on your lunch break, Kingsley said. Ask for Mrs. Robertson, he pointed a finger that was showing the first gnarls of arthritis. And don't you fuck up, Sonny Jim, because she's an old pal of mine. Remember that I vouched for you on some pretty thin paper and Billy Freeman's intuition. Dan said he wouldn't fuck up, but the extra sincerity he tried to inject into his voice sounded phony to his own ears. He was thinking of his father again, reduced to begging jobs from a wealthy old friend after losing his teaching position in Vermont. It was strange to feel sympathy for a man who had almost killed you, but the sympathy was there. Had people felt it necessary to tell his father not to fuck up? Probably. And Jack Torrance had fucked up anyway, spectacularly. Five stars. Drinking was undoubtedly a part of it, but when you were down, some guys just seemed to feel an urge to walk up your back and plant a foot on your neck instead of helping you to stand. It was lousy, but so much of human nature was. Of course, when you were running with the bottom dogs, what you mostly saw were paws, claws, and assholes. And see if Billy can find some boots that'll fit you. He squirreled away about a dozen pairs in the equipment shed, although the last time I looked, only half of them matched. The day was sunny, the air balmy. Dan, who was working in jeans and a Utica Blue Sox t-shirt, looked up at the nearly cloudless sky and then back at Casey Kingsley. Yeah, I know how it looks. But this is mountain country, pal. Noah claims we're going to have a nor'easter, and it'll drop maybe a foot. Won't last long. Poor man's fertilizer is what New Hampshire folks call April snow, but there's also going to be gale force winds. So they say. I hope you can use a snowblower as well as a leaf blower. He paused. I also hope your back's okay, because you and Billy will be picking up plenty of dead limbs tomorrow. Might be cutting up some fallen trees, too. You okay with a chainsaw? Yes, sir, Dan said. Good. Eight. Dan and Mrs. Robertson came to amicable terms. She even offered him an egg salad sandwich and a cup of coffee in the communal kitchen. He took her up on it, expecting all the usual questions about what had brought him to Fraser and where he had been before. Refreshingly, there were none. Instead, she asked him if he had time to help her close the shutters on the downstairs windows in case they really did get what she called a kappa wind. Dan agreed. There weren't many mottos he lived by, but one was always get in good with the landlady. You never know when you might have to ask her for a rent extension. Back on the common, Billy was waiting with a list of chores. The day before, the two of them had taken the tarps off all the kiddie rides. That afternoon, they put them back on and shuttered the various booths and concessions. The day's final job was backing the riv into her shed. Then they sat in folding chairs beside the teeny town station, smoking. Tell you what, Dano, Billy said. I'm one tired, hired man. You're not the only one. But he felt okay, muscles limber and tingling. He'd forgotten how good outdoors work could be when you weren't also working off a hangover. The sky had scummed over with clouds. Billy looked up at them and sighed. I hope to God it don't snow and blow as hard as the radio says, but it probably will. I found you some boots. They don't look like much, but at least they match. Dan took the boots with him when he walked across town to his new accommodations. By then the wind was picking up and the day was growing dark. 
That morning, Frazier had felt on the edge of summer. This evening, the air held the face-freezing dampness of coming snow. The side streets were deserted and the houses buttoned up. Dan turned the corner from Moorhead Street onto Elliot and paused. Blowing down the sidewalk, attended by a skeletal scutter of last year's autumn leaves, was a battered top hat, such as a magician might wear. Or maybe an actor in an old musical comedy, he thought. Looking at it made him feel cold in his bones, because it wasn't there. Not really. He closed his eyes, slow counted to five with the strengthening wind flapping the legs of his jeans around his shins, then opened them again. The leaves were still there, but the top hat was gone. It had just been the shining, producing one of its vivid, unsettling, and usually senseless visions. It was always stronger when he'd been sober for a little while, but never as strong as it had been since coming to Fraser. It was as if the air here were different somehow more conducive to those strange transmissions from planet elsewhere, special. The way the Overlook was special. No, he said, no, I don't believe that. A few drinks and it all goes away, Danny. Do you believe that? Unfortunately, he did. Nine. Mrs. Robertson's was a rambling old colonial, and Dan's third-floor room had a view of the mountains to the west. That was a panorama he could have done without. His recollections of the overlook had faded to hazy gray over the years, but as he unpacked his few things, a memory surfaced. And it was a kind of surfacing, like some nasty organic artifact, the decayed body of a small animal, say floating to the surface of a deep lake. It was dusk when the first real snow came. We stood on the porch of that big old empty hotel, my dad in the middle, my mom on one side, me on the other. He had his arms around us. He was okay then. He wasn't drinking then. At first the snow fell in perfectly straight lines, but then the wind picked up, and it started to blow sideways, drifting against the sides of the porch and coating those. He tried to block it off, but it got through. Those hedge animals, the ones that sometimes moved around when you weren't looking. He turned away from the window, his arms rashed out in goose flesh. He'd gotten a sandwich from the Red Apple store and had planned to eat it while he started the John Sanford paperback he'd also picked up at the Red Apple, but after a few bites, he rewrapped the sandwich and put it on the window sill, where it would stay cold. He might eat the rest later, although he didn't think he'd be staying up much past nine tonight. If he got a hundred pages into the book, he'd be doing well. Outside, the wind continued to rise. Every now and then gave a blood-curdling scream around the eaves that made him look up from his book. Around 8.30, the snow began. It was heavy and wet, quickly coating his window and blocking his view of the mountains. In a way, that was worse. The snow had blocked the windows in the overlook, too. First just on the first floor, then on the second, and finally on the third. And then they had been entombed with the lively dead. My father thought they'd make him the manager. All he had to do was show his loyalty by giving them his son. His only begotten son, Dan muttered, then looked around as if someone else had spoken. And indeed, he did not feel alone. Not quite alone. The wind shrieked down the side of the building again, and he shuddered. Not too late to go back down to the Red Apple, grab a bottle of something put all these unpleasant thoughts to bed. No, he was going to read his book. Lucas Davenport was on the case and he was going to read his book. He closed it at quarter past nine and got into another rooming house bed. I won't sleep, he thought, not with the wind screaming like that. 
but he did. 10. He was sitting at the mouth of the storm drain, looking down a scrub grass slope at the Cape Fear River and the bridge that spanned it. The night was clear and the moon was full. There was no wind, no snow, and the overlook was gone even if it hadn't burned to the ground during the tenure of the peanut farmer president, it would have been over a thousand miles from here. So why was he so frightened? Because he wasn't alone. That was why. There was someone behind him. Want some advice, honey bear? The voice was liquid, wavering. Dan felt a chill go rushing down his back. His legs were colder still, prickled out in star points of goose flesh. He could see those white bumps because he was wearing shorts. Of course he was wearing shorts. His brain might be that of a grown man, but it was currently sitting on top of a five-year-old's body. Honey bear? Who? But he knew. He had told Deanie his name, but she didn't use it. Just called him Honey Bear instead. You don't remember that. And besides, this is just a dream. Of course it was. He was in Fraser, New Hampshire, sleeping while a spring snowstorm howled outside Mrs. Robertson's rooming house. Still, it seemed wiser not to turn around. And safer, that too. No advice, he said, looking out at the river in the full moon. I've been advised by experts. The bars and barber shops are full of them. Stay away from the woman in the hat, honey bear. What hat, he could have asked, but really, why bother? He knew the hat she was talking about because he had seen it blowing down the sidewalk, black as sin on the outside, lined with white silk on the inside. She's the queen bitch of Castle Hell. If you mess with her... She'll eat you alive. He turned his head. He couldn't help it. Deanie was sitting behind him in the storm drain with the bum's blanket wrapped around her naked shoulders. Her hair was plastered to her cheeks. Her face was bloated and dripping. Her eyes were cloudy. She was dead, probably years in her grave. You're not real. Dan tried to say, but no words came out. He was five again. Danny was five. The overlook was ashes and bones, but here was a dead woman one he had stolen from. It's all right, she said, bubbling voice coming from a swollen throat. I sold the coke, stepped on it first with a little sugar, and got two hundred. She grinned and water spilled through her teeth. I liked you, honey bear. That's why I came to warn you. Stay away from the woman in the hat. False face, Dan said, but it was Danny's voice, the high, frail, chanting voice of a child. False face, not there, not real. He closed his eyes as he had often closed them when he had seen terrible things in the overlook. The woman began to scream, but he wouldn't open his eyes. The screaming went on, rising and falling, and he realized it was the scream of the wind. He wasn't in Colorado, and he wasn't in North Carolina. He was in New Hampshire. He'd had a bad dream, but the dream was over. Eleven. According to his Timex, it was two in the morning. The room was cold, but his arms and chest were slimy with sweat. Want some advice, honey bear? No, he said, not from you. She's dead. There was no way he could know that, but he did. Dini, who had looked like the goddess of the Western world in her thigh-high leather skirt and cork sandals, was dead. He even knew how she had done it took pills, pinned up her hair, climbed into a bathtub filled with warm water, went to sleep, slid under, drowned. 
The roar of the wind was dreadfully familiar, loaded with hollow threat. Wind blew everywhere, but it only sounded like this in the high country. It was as if some angry god were pounding the world with an air mallet. I used to call his booze the bad stuff, Dan thought. Only sometimes it's the good stuff. When you wake up from a nightmare that you know is at least 50% shining, it's the very good stuff. One drink would send him back to sleep. Three would guarantee not just sleep, but dreamless sleep. Sleep was nature's doctor, and right now Dan Torrance felt sick and in need of strong medicine. Nothing's open. You looked out there. Well, maybe. He turned on his side and something rolled against his back when he did. No, not something. Someone. Someone had gotten into bed with him. Deanie had gotten into bed with him. Only it felt too small to be Deanie. It felt more like... He scrambled out of bed, landed awkwardly on the floor, and looked over his shoulder. It was Deanie's little boy, Tommy. The right side of his skull was caved in. Bone splinters protruded through blood-stained fair hair. Gray scaly muck. Brains was drying on one cheek. He couldn't be alive with such a hellacious wound. But he was. He reached out to Dan with one starfish hand. Can he? he said. The screaming began again. Only this time, it wasn't Deanie, and it wasn't the wind. This time it was him. Twelve. When he woke for the second time, real waking this time, he wasn't screaming at all, only making a kind of low growling deep in his chest. He sat up gasping, the bedclothes puddled around his waist. There was no one else in his bed, but the dream hadn't yet dissolved and looking wasn't enough. He threw back the bedclothes, and that still wasn't enough. He ran his hands down the bottom sheet, feeling for fugitive warmth or a dent that might have been made by small hips and buttocks. Nothing. Of course not. So then he looked under the bed and saw only his borrowed boots. The wind was blowing less strongly now. The storm wasn't over, but it was winding down. He went to the bathroom, then whirled and looked back, as if expecting to surprise someone. There was just the bed, with the covers now lying on the floor at the foot. He turned on the light over the sink, splashed his face with cold water, and sat down on the closed lid of the commode, taking long breaths, one after the other. He thought about getting up and grabbing a cigarette from the pack lying beside his book on the room's one small table, but his legs felt rubbery and he wasn't sure they'd hold him. Not yet, anyway. So he sat. He could see the bed, and the bed was empty. The whole room was empty. No problem there. Only, it didn't feel empty. Not yet. When it did, he supposed he would go back to bed, but not to sleep. For this night, sleep was done. Thirteen. Seven years before, working as an orderly in a Tulsa hospice, Dan had made friends with an elderly psychiatrist who was suffering from terminal liver cancer. One day, when Emil Kimmer had been reminiscing, not very discreetly, about a few of his more interesting cases, Dan had confessed that ever since childhood he had suffered from what he called double dreaming. Was Kimmer familiar with the phenomenon? Was there a name for it? Kimmer had been a large man in his prime. The old black-and-white wedding photo he kept on his bedside table attested to that. But cancer is the ultimate diet program and on the day of this conversation his weight had been approximately the same as his age, which was ninety-one. His mind had still been sharp, however, and now, sitting on the closed toilet and listening to the dying storm outside, Dan remembered the old man's sly smile. Yes, he had said in his heavy German accent, 
I am paid for my diagnosis, Daniel. Dan had grinned. Guess I'm out of luck then. Perhaps not. Kimmer studied Dan. His eyes were bright blue. Although he knew it was outrageously unfair, Dan couldn't help imagining those eyes under a Waffen-SS coal scuttle helmet. There's a rumor in this death house that you are a kid with a talent for helping people die. Is this true? Sometimes, Dan said cautiously. Not always. The truth was, almost always. When the time comes, will you help me? If I can, of course. Good. Kimmer sat up, a laboriously painful process, but when Dan moved to help, Kimmer had waved him away. What you call double dreaming is well known to psychiatrists and of particular interest to Jungians, who call it false awakening. The first dream is usually a lucid dream, meaning the dreamer knows he is dreaming. Yes, Dan cried, but the second one. The dreamer believes he is awake, Kemmer said. Jung made much of this, even ascribing precognitive powers to these dreams. But of course, we know better, don't we, Dan? Of course, Dan had agreed. The poet Edgar Allan Poe described the false awakening phenomenon long before Carl Jung was born. He wrote, All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. Have I answered your question? I think so. Thanks. You're welcome. Now I believe I could drink a little juice. Apple, please. Fourteen. Precognitive powers. But of course we know better. Even if he hadn't kept a shining almost entirely to himself over the years, Dan would not have presumed to contradict a dying man especially one with such coldly inquisitive blue eyes. The truth, however, was that one or both of his double dreams were often predictive, usually in ways he only half understood or did not understand at all. But as he sat on the toilet seat in his underwear, now shivering, and not just because the room was cold, he understood much more than he wanted to. Tommy was dead, murdered by his abusive uncle, most likely. The mother had committed suicide not long after. As for the rest of the dream, or the phantom hat he'd seen earlier spinning down the sidewalk. Stay away from the woman in the hat. She's the queen bitch of Castle Hell. I don't care, Dan said. If you mess with her, she'll eat you alive. He had no intention of meeting her, let alone messing with her. As for Dini, he wasn't responsible for either her short-fused brother or her child neglect. He didn't even have to carry around the guilt about her lousy seventy dollars anymore. She had sold the cocaine. He was sure that part of the dream was absolutely true, and they were square. More than square, actually. What he cared about was getting a drink. Getting drunk, not to put too fine a point on it. Standing up, falling down, pissy-ass drunk. Warm morning sunshine was good, and the pleasant feeling of muscles that had been worked hard and waking up in the morning without a hangover. But the price. All these crazy dreams and visions. Not to mention the random thoughts of passing strangers that sometimes found their way past his defenses. Was too high. Too high to bear. Fifteen. He sat in the room's only chair and read his John Sanford novel by the light of the room's only lamp until the two town churches with bells rang in seven o'clock. Then he pulled on his new, new to him anyway, boots and duffel coat. He headed out into a world that had changed and softened. There wasn't a sharp edge anywhere. The snow was still falling, but gently now. I should get out of here. Go back to Florida. Fuck New Hampshire, where it probably even snows on the 4th of July in odd-numbered years. Halloran's voice answered him, the tone as kind as he remembered from his childhood when Dan had been Danny, 
but there was hard steel underneath. You better stay somewhere, honey, or you won't be able to stay anywhere. Fuck you, old-timer, he muttered. He went back to the Red Apple because the stores that sold hard liquor wouldn't be open for at least another hour. He walked slowly back and forth between the wine cooler and the beer cooler, debating, and finally decided if he was going to get drunk he might as well do it as nastily as possible. He grabbed two bottles of Thunderbird, 18% alcohol, a good enough number when whiskey was temporarily out of reach, started up the aisle to the register, then stopped. Give it one more day. Give yourself one more chance. He supposed he could do that, but why? So he could wake up in bed with Tommy again? Tommy with half his skull caved in? Or maybe next time it would be Deanie, who had lain in that tub for two days before the super finally got tired of knocking, used his passkey and found her. He couldn't know that. If Emil Kimmer had been here, he would have agreed most emphatically, but he did. He did know. So why bother? Maybe this hyper-awareness will pass. Maybe it's just a phase, the psychic equivalent of the DTs. Maybe if you just give it a little more time. But time changed. That was something only drunks and junkies understood. When you couldn't sleep, when you were afraid to look around because of what you might see, time elongated and grew sharp teeth. Help you? The clerk asked, and Dan knew, fucking shining, fucking thing, that he was making the clerk nervous. Why not? With his bed head, dark circled eyes, and jerky, unsure movements, he probably looked like a meth freak who was deciding whether or not to pull out his trusty Saturday night special and ask for everything in the register. No, Dan said. I just realized I left my wallet home. He put the green bottles back in the cooler. As he closed it, they spoke to him gently, as one friend speaks to another. See you soon, Danny. Sixteen. Billy Freeman was waiting for him, bundled up to the eyebrows. He held out an old-fashioned ski hat with Aniston Cyclones embroidered on the front. What the hell are the Aniston Cyclones? Dan asked. Aniston's twenty miles north of here. When it comes to football, basketball, and baseball, they're our arch rivals. Someone sees that on you, you'll probably get a snowball upside your head, but it's the only one I've got. Dan hauled it on. Then go, Cyclones. Right. Fuck you and the horse you rode in on. Billy looked him over. You all right, Dano? Didn't get much sleep last night. I hear that. Damn wind really screamed, didn't it? Sounded like my ex when I suggested a little Monday night lovin' might do us good. Ready to go to work? Ready as I'll ever be. Good. Let's dig in. Gonna be a busy day. Seventeen. It was indeed a busy day. But by noon the sun had come out and the temperature had climbed back into the mid-fifties. Teeny Town was filled with the sound of a hundred small waterfalls as the snow melted. Dan's spirits rose with the temperature and he even caught himself singing, Young man, I was once in your shoes, as he followed his snowblower back and forth in the courtyard of the little shopping center adjacent to the common. Overhead, flapping in a mild breeze far removed from the shrieking wind of the night before, was a banner reading, Huge Spring Bargains at Teeny Town Prices. There were no visions. After they clocked out, he took Billy to the chuck wagon and ordered them steak dinners. Billy offered to buy the beer. Dan shook his head. Staying away from alcohol. Reason being, once I start, it's sometimes hard to stop. You could talk to Kingsley about that, Billy said. He got himself a booze divorce about fifteen years ago. He's all right now, but his daughter still don't talk to him. They drank coffee with the meal, a lot of it. Dan went back to his third-floor Elliott Street lair, tired, full of hot food, and glad to be sober. There was no TV in his room, but he had the last part of the Sanford novel and lost himself in it for a couple of hours. He kept an ear out for the wind, but it did not rise. 
He had an idea that last night's storm had been winter's final shot, which was fine with him. He turned in at ten and fell asleep almost immediately. His early morning visit to the Red Apple now seemed hazy, as if he had gone there in a fever delirium and the fever had now passed. Eighteen. He woke in the small hours, not because the wind was blowing, but because he had to piss like a racehorse. He got up, shuffled to the bathroom, and turned on the light inside the door. The top hat was in the tub and full of blood. No, he said, I'm dreaming. Maybe double dreaming, or triple, quadruple even. There was something he hadn't told Emo Kimmer. He was afraid that eventually he would get lost in a maze of phantom nightlife and never be able to find his way out again. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. Only this was real. So was the hat. No one else would see it, but that changed nothing. The hat was real. It was somewhere in the world. He knew it. From the corner of his eye, he saw something written on the mirror over the sink. Something written in lipstick. I must not look at it. Too late. His head was turning. He could hear the tendons in his neck creaking like old door hinges. And what did it matter? He knew what it said. Mrs. Massey was gone. Horace Derwent was gone. They were securely locked away in the boxes he kept far back in his mind. But the overlook was still not done with him. Written on the mirror, not in lipstick, but in blood, was a single word. Red rum. Beneath it, lying in the sink, was a blood-stained Atlanta Braves t-shirt. It will never stop, Danny thought. The overlook burned and the most terrible of its revenants went into the lock boxes. But I can't lock away the shining, because it isn't just inside me. It is me. Without booze to at least stun it, these visions will go on until they drive me insane. He could see his face in the mirror with red rum floating in front of it, stamped on his forehead like a brand. This was not a dream. There was a murdered child's shirt in his wash basin and a hat full of blood in his tub. Insanity was coming. He could see its approach in his own bulging eyes. Then, like a flashlight beam in the dark, Halloran's voice. Son, you may see things, but they're like pictures in a book. You weren't helpless in Overlook when you were a child, and you're not helpless now. Far from it. Close your eyes, and when you open them, all this crap will be gone. He closed his eyes and waited. He tried to count off the seconds, but only made it to fourteen before the numbers were lost in the roaring confusion of his thoughts. He half expected hands, perhaps those of whoever owned the hat, to close around his neck. But he stood there. There was really nowhere else to go. Summoning all his courage, Dan opened his eyes. The tub was empty. The wash basin was empty. There was nothing written on the mirror. But it will be back. Next time, maybe it'll be her shoes. Those cork sandals or I'll see her in a tub. Why not? That's where I saw Mrs. Massey, and they died the same way. Except I never stole Mrs. Massey's money and ran out on her. I gave it a day, he told the empty room. I did that much. Yes, and although it had been a busy day, it had also been a good day. He'd be the first to admit it. The days weren't the problem. As for the nights... The mind was a blackboard. Booze was the eraser. Nineteen. Dan lay awake until six. Then he dressed and once more made the trek to the Red Apple. This time he did not hesitate, only instead of extracting two bottles of bird from the cooler, he took three. What was it they used to say? Go big or go home. The clerk bagged the bottles without comment. He was used to early wine purchases. 
Dan strolled to the town common, sat on one of the benches in Teeny Town, and took one of the bottles out of the bag, looking down at it like Hamlet with Yorick's skull. Through the green glass, what was inside looked like rat poison instead of wine. You say that like it's a bad thing, Dan said, and loosened the cap. This time, it was his mother who spoke up. Wendy Torrance, who had smoked right to the bitter end, because if suicide was the only option, you could at least choose your weapon. Is this how it ends, Danny? Is this what it was all for? He turned the cap witter shins, then tightened it, then back the other way. This time he took it off. The smell of the wine was sour. The smell of jukebox music and crappy bars and pointless arguments followed by fistfights in parking lots. In the end, life was as stupid as one of those fights. The world wasn't a hospice with fresh air. The world was the Overlook Hotel where the party never ended. Where the dead were alive forever. He raised the bottle to his lips. Is this why we fought so hard to get out of that damned hotel, Danny? Why we fought to make a new life for ourselves? There was no reproach in her voice, only sadness. Danny tightened the cap again, then loosened it, tightened it, loosened it. He thought, if I drink, the overlook wins. Even though it burned to the ground when the boiler exploded, it wins. If I don't drink, I go crazy. He thought, all that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. He was still tightening the cap and loosening it when Billy Freeman, who had awakened early with the vague, alarmed sense that something was wrong, found him. Are you going to drink that, Dan, or just keep jacking it off? Drink it, I guess. I don't know what else to do. So Billy told him. Twenty. Casey Kingsley wasn't entirely surprised to see his new hire sitting outside his office when he arrived at quarter past eight that morning. Nor was he surprised to see the bottle Torrance was holding in his hands, first twisting the cap off, then putting it back on and turning it tight again. He'd had that special look from the start, the thousand-yard Cappy's discount liquor store stare. Billy Freeman didn't have as much shine as Dan himself, not even close, but a bit more than just a twinkle. On that first day, he had called Kingsley from the equipment shed as soon as Dan headed across the street to the municipal building. There was a young fella looking for work, Billy said. He wasn't apt to have much in the way of references, but Billy thought he was the right man to help out until Memorial Day. Kingsley, who'd had experiences, good ones with Billy's intuitions before, had agreed. I know we've got to have someone, he said. Billy's reply had been peculiar, but then Billy was peculiar. Once, two years ago, he had called an ambulance five minutes before that little kid had fallen off the swings and fractured his skull. He needs us more than we need him, Billy had said. And here he was, sitting hunched forward as if he were already riding his next bus or bar stool, and Kingsley could smell the wine from twelve yards down the hallway. He had a gourmet's nose for such scents and could name each one. This was Thunderbird, as in the old saloon rhyme. What's the word, Thunderbird? What's the price, fifty twice? But when the young guy looked up at him, Kingsley saw the eyes were clear of everything but desperation. Billy sent me. Kingsley said nothing. He could see the kid gathering himself, struggling with it. It was in his eyes. It was in the way his mouth turned down at the corners. Mostly it was the way he held the bottle, hating it and loving it and needing it all at the same time. At last Dan brought out the words he had been running from all his life. I need help. He swiped an arm across his eyes. As he did, Kingsley bent down and grasped the bottle of wine. The kid held on for a moment, then let go. You're sick and you're tired, 
Kingsley said. I can see that much. But are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Dan looked up at him, throat working. He struggled some more and then said, You don't know how much. Maybe I do. Kingsley produced a vast key ring from his vast trousers. He stuck one in the lock of the door with Frazier Municipal Services painted on the frosted glass. Come on in. Let's talk about it. Chapter 2 Bad Numbers 1. The elderly poet with the Italian given name and the absolutely American surname sat with her sleeping great-granddaughter in her lap and watched the video her granddaughter's husband had shot in the delivery room three weeks before. It began with a title card, Abra Enters the World. The footage was jerky, and David had kept away from anything too clinical, thank God. But Conchetta Reynolds saw the sweat-plastered hair on Lucia's brow, heard her cry out, I am! when one of the nurses exhorted her to push, and saw the droplets of blood on the blue drape. Not many, just enough to make what Chetta's own grandmother would have called a fair show. But not in English, of course. The picture jiggled when the baby finally came into view, and she felt goose flesh chase up her back and arms when Lucy screamed, She has no face! Sitting beside Lucy now, David chuckled, because, of course, Abra did have a face, a very sweet one. Chetta looked down at it as if to reassure herself of that. When she looked back up, the new baby was being placed in the new mother's arms. Thirty or forty jerky seconds later, another title card appeared. Happy birthday, Abra Raffaella Stone. David pushed stop on the remote. You're one of the very few people who will ever get to see that, Lucy announced in a firm take-no-prisoner's voice. It's embarrassing. It's wonderful, Dave said, and there's one person who gets to see it for sure, and that's Abra herself. He glanced at his wife sitting next to him on the couch. When she's old enough, and if she wants to, of course. He patted Lucy's thigh, then grinned at his granny-in-law, a woman for whom he had respect but no great love. Until then, it goes in the safe deposit box with the insurance papers, the house papers, and my millions in drug money. Conchetta smiled to show she got the joke, but thinly, to show she didn't find it particularly funny. In her lap, Abra slept and slept. In a way, all babies were born with a call, she thought, their tiny faces drapes of mystery and possibility. Perhaps it was a thing to write about. Perhaps not. Conchetta had come to America when she was twelve and spoke perfect idiomatic English, not surprising since she was a graduate of Vassar and professor, now emeritus, of that very subject. But in her head, every superstition and old wives' tale still lived. Sometimes they gave orders, and they always spoke Italian when they did. Chetta believed that most people who worked in the arts were high-functioning schizophrenics, and she was no different. She knew superstition was shit. She also spat between her fingers if a crow or a black cat crossed her path. For much of her own schizophrenia, she had the Sisters of Mercy to thank. They believed in God. They believed in the divinity of Jesus. They believed mirrors were bewitching pools, and the child who looked into one too long would grow warts. These were the women who had been the greatest influence on her life between the ages of seven and twelve. They carried rulers in their belts for hitting, not measuring, and never saw a child's ear they did not desire to twist in passing. Lucy held out her arms for the baby. Chetta handed her over, not without reluctance. The kid was one sweet bundle. Two. Twenty miles southeast of where Abra slept in Conchetta Reynolds' arms, Dan Torrance was attending an AA meeting while some chick droned on about sex with her ex. K. 
Casey Kingsley had ordered him to attend 90 meetings in 90 days, and this one, a nooner in the basement of Fraser Methodist Church, was his eighth. He was sitting in the first row because Casey, known in the halls as Big Casey, had ordered him to do that, too. Sick people who want to get well, sit in front, Danny. We call the back row at AA meetings the denial aisle. Casey had given him a little notebook with a photo on the front that showed ocean waves crashing into a rock promontory. Printed above the picture was a motto Dan understood but didn't much care for. No great thing is created suddenly. You write down every meeting you go to in that book, and any time I ask to see it, you better be able to haul it out of your back pocket and show me perfect attendance. Don't I even get a sick day? Casey laughed. You're sick every day, my friend. You're a drunk-ass alcoholic. Want to know something my sponsor told me? I think you already did. You can't turn a pickle back into a cucumber, right? Don't be a smart-ass. Just listen. Dan sighed. Listening. Get your ass to a meeting, he said. If your ass falls off, put it in a bag and take it to a meeting. Charming. What if I just forget? Casey had shrugged. Then you find yourself another sponsor, one who believes in forgetfulness. I don't. Dan, who felt like some breakable object that has skittered to the edge of a high shelf but hasn't quite fallen off, didn't want another sponsor or changes of any kind. He felt okay, but tender. Very tender. Almost skinless. The visions that had plagued him following his arrival in Fraser had ceased, and although he often thought of Deanie and her little boy, the thoughts were not as painful. At the end of almost every AA meeting, someone read the promises. One of these was, We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. Dan thought he would always regret the past, but he had quit trying to shut the door. Why bother when it would just come open again? The fucking thing had no latch, let alone a lock. Now, he began to print a single word on the current page of the little book Casey had given him. He made large, careful letters. He had no idea why he was doing it or what it meant. The word was Abra. Meanwhile, the speaker reached the end of her qualification and burst into tears, through them declaring that even though her ex was a shit and she loved him still, she was grateful to be straight and sober. Dan applauded along with the rest of the lunch bunch, then began to color in the letters with his pen, fattening them, making them stand out. Do I know this name? I think I do. As the next speaker began and he went to the urn for a fresh cup of coffee, it came to him. Abra was the name of a girl in a John Steinbeck novel, East of Eden. He'd read it. He couldn't remember where. Had some stop along the way? Some somewhere? It didn't matter. Another thought, did you save it, rose to the top of his mind like a bubble and popped. Save what? Frankie P., the lunch bunch old-timer who was chairing the meeting, asked if someone wanted to do the chip club. When no one raised a hand, Frankie pointed, How about you, lurking back there by the coffee? Feeling self-conscious, Dan walked to the front of the room, hoping he could remember the order of the chips. The first, white for beginners, he had. As he took the battered cookie tin with the chips and medallions scattered inside it, the thought came again. Did you save it? Three. That was the day the true knot, which had been wintering at a KOA campground in Arizona, packed up and began meandering back east. They drove along Route 77 towards Sholo in the usual caravan. Fourteen campers, some towing cars, some with lawn chairs or bicycles clamped to the backs. There were south winds and Winnebago's, Monaco's and Bounders. Rose's Earth Cruiser, $700,000 worth of imported rolling steel, the best RV money could buy, led the parade. Slowly, 
just double-nickling it. They were in no hurry. There was plenty of time. The feast was still months away. Four. Did you save it? Conchetta asked as Lucy opened her blouse and offered Abra the breast. Abby blinked sleepily, rooted a little, then lost interest. Once your nipples get sore, you won't offer until she asks, Chetta thought. And at the top of her lungs. Save what? David asked. Lucy knew. I passed out right after they put her in my arms. Dave says I almost dropped her. There was no time, Momo. Oh, that goop over her face, David said it dismissively. They stripped it off and threw it away. Damn good thing, if you ask me. He was smiling, but his eyes challenged her. You know better than to go on with this, they said. You know better, so just drop it. She did know better, and didn't. Had she been this two-minded when she was younger? She couldn't remember, although it seems she could remember every lecture on the blessed mysteries and the everlasting pain of hell administered by the Sisters of Mercy, those banditti in black. The story of the girl who had been struck blind for peeping at her brother while he was naked in the tub, and the one about the man who had been struck dead for blaspheming against the Pope. Give them to us when they're young, and it doesn't matter how many honors classes they've taught, or how many books of poetry they've written, or even that one of those books won all the big prizes. Give them to us when they're young, and they're ours forever. You should have saved Il Amnio. It's good luck. She spoke directly to her granddaughter, cutting David out entirely. He was a good man, a good husband to her, Lucia. But fuck his dismissive tone, and double fuck his challenging eyes. I would have, but I didn't have a chance, Momo, and Dave didn't know, buttoning her blouse again. Chetta leaned forward and touched the fine skin of Abra's cheek with the tip of her finger, old flesh sliding across new. Those born with El Amnio are supposed to have double sight. You don't actually believe that, do you? David asked. A call is nothing but a scrap of fetal membrane, it... He was saying more, but Conchetta paid no attention. Abra had opened her eyes. In them was a universe of poetry, lines too great to ever be written or even remembered. Never mind, Conchetta said. She raised the baby and kissed the smooth skull where the fontanelle pulsed, the magic of the mind so close beneath. What's done is done. Five. One night, about five months after the not-quite argument over Abra's call, Lucy dreamed her daughter was crying, crying as if her heart would break. In this dream, Abby was no longer in the master bedroom of the house on Richland Court, but somewhere down a long corridor. Lucy ran in the direction of the weeping. At first there were doors on both sides, then seats, blue ones with high backs. She was on a plane or maybe an Amtrak train. After running for what seemed like miles, she came to a bathroom door. Her baby was crying behind it. Not a hungry cry, but a frightened cry. Maybe, oh God, oh Mary, a hurt cry. Lucy was terribly afraid the door would be locked and she would have to break it down. Wasn't that the kind of thing that always happened in bad dreams? But the knob twisted and she opened it. As she did, a new fear struck her. What if Abra was in the toilet? You read about that happening. Babies in toilets, babies in dumpsters. What if she were drowning in one of those ugly steel bowls they had on public conveyances up to her mouth and nose and disinfected blue water? but Abra lay on the floor. She was naked. Her eyes, swimming with tears, stared at her mother. Written on her chest, in what looked like blood, was the number eleven. Six. David Stone dreamed he was chasing his daughter's cries up an endless escalator that was running 
slowly but inexorably in the wrong direction. Worse, the escalator was in a mall and the mall was on fire. He should have been choking and out of breath long before he reached the top, but there was no smoke from the fire, only a hell of flames. Nor was there any sound other than Abra's cries, although he saw people burning like kerosene-soaked torches. When he finally made it to the top, he saw Abby lying on the floor like someone's cast-off garbage. Men and women ran all around her, unheeding, and in spite of the flames, no one tried to use the escalator even though it was going down. They simply sprinted aimlessly in all directions, like ants whose hill has been torn open by a farmer's harrow. One woman in stilettos almost stepped on his daughter, a thing that would almost surely have killed her. Abra was naked. Written on her chest was the number 175. 7. The stones woke together, both initially convinced that the cries they heard were a remnant of the dreams they had been having, but no, the cries were in the room with them. Abby lay in her crib beneath her Shrekmobile, eyes wide, cheeks red, tiny fists pumping, howling her head off. A change of diapers did not quiet her, nor did the breast, nor did what felt like miles of laps up and down the hall and at least a thousand verses of the wheels on the bus. At last, very frightened now, Abby was her first and Lucy was at her wit's end. She called Conchetta in Boston. Although it was two in the morning, Momo answered on the second ring. She was eighty-five, and her sleep was as thin as her skin. She listened more closely to her wailing great-granddaughter than to Lucy's confused recital of all the ordinary remedies they had tried, then asked the pertinent questions. Is she running a fever? Pulling at one of her ears? Jerking her legs like she has to make merda? No, Lucy said, none of that. She's a little warm from crying, but I don't think it's a fever. Momo, what should I do? Chetta, now sitting at her desk, didn't hesitate. Give her another fifteen minutes. If she doesn't quiet and begin feeding, take her to the hospital. What? Brigham and women's? Confused and upset, it was all Lucy could think of. It was where she had given birth. That's a hundred and fifty miles. No, no. Bridgeton, across the border in Maine. That's a little closer than C&H. Are you sure? Am I looking at my computer right now? Abra did not quiet. The crying was monotonous, maddening, terrifying. When they arrived at Bridgeton Hospital, it was quarter of four and Abra was still at full volume. Rides in the Acura were usually better than a sleeping pill, but not this morning. David thought about brain aneurysms and told himself he was out of his mind. Babies didn't have strokes, did they? Davy, Lucy asked in a small voice as they pulled up to the sign reading emergency drop-off only. Babies don't have strokes or heart attacks, do they? No, I'm sure they don't. But a new idea occurred to him then. Suppose the kiddo had somehow swallowed a safety pin and it had popped open in her stomach. That's stupid. We use Huggies. She's never even been near a safety pin. Something else, then. A bobby pin from Lucy's hair. An errant tack that had fallen into the crib. Maybe even God help them. A broken off piece of plastic from Shrek, Donkey, or Princess Fiona. Davy, what are you thinking? Nothing. The mobile was fine. He was sure of it. Almost sure. Abra continued to scream. Eight. David hoped the doc on duty would give his daughter a sedative, but it was against protocol for infants who could not be diagnosed, and Abra Raffaella Stone seemed to have nothing wrong with her. She wasn't running a fever. She wasn't showing a rash. An ultrasound had ruled out pyloric stenosis. An X-ray showed no foreign objects in her throat or stomach or a bowel obstruction. Basically, she just wouldn't shut up. The Stones were the only patients in the ER at that hour on a Tuesday morning, and each of the three nurses on duty had a try at quieting her. Nothing worked. Shouldn't you give her something to eat? 
Lucy asked the doctor when he came back to check. The phrase ringers lactate occurred to her, something she'd heard on one of the doctor's shows she'd watched ever since her teenage crush on George Clooney. But for all she knew, ringers lactate was foot lotion or an anticoagulant or something for stomach ulcers. She won't take the breast or the bottle. When she gets hungry enough, she'll eat, the doctor said, but neither Lucy nor David was much comforted. For one thing, the doctor looked younger than they were. For another, this was far worse, he didn't sound completely sure. Have you called your pediatrician? He checked the paperwork. Dr. Dalton? Left a message with his service, David said. We probably won't hear from him until mid-morning, and by then this will be over. One way or the other, he thought, and his mind, made ungovernable by too little sleep and too much anxiety, presented him with a picture as clear as it was horrifying. Mourners standing around a small grave and an even smaller coffin. 9. At 7.30... Cheddar Reynolds blew into the examining room where the stones and their ceaselessly screaming baby daughter had been stashed. The poet, rumored to be on the short list for a presidential medal of freedom, was dressed in straight-leg jeans and a BU sweatshirt with a hole in one elbow. The outfit showed just how thin she'd become over the last three or four years. No cancer, if that's what you're thinking, she'd say if anyone commented on her runway model thinness which she ordinarily disguised with billowing dresses or caftans. I'm just in training for the final lap around the track. Her hair, as a rule braided or put up in complicated swoops arranged to showcase her collection of vintage hair clips, stood out around her head in an unkempt Einstein cloud. She wore no makeup, and even in her distress, Lucy was shocked by how old Conchetta looked. Well, of course she was old. Eighty-five was very old, but until this morning she had looked like a woman in her late sixties at most. I would have been here an hour earlier if I'd found someone to come in and take care of Betty. Betty was her elderly, ailing boxer. Chetta caught David's reproachful glance. Betts is dying, David, and based on what you could tell me over the phone, I wasn't all that concerned about Abra. Are you concerned now? David asked. Lucy flashed him a warning glance, but Chetta seemed willing to accept the implied rebuke. Yes, she held out her hands. Give her to me, Lucy. Let's see if she'll quiet for Momo. But Abra would not quiet for Momo, no matter how she was rocked. Nor did a soft and surprisingly tuneful lullaby, for all David knew it was the wheels on the bus in Italian, do the job. They all tried the walking cure again, first squiring her around the small exam room, then down the hall, then back to the exam room. The screaming went on and on. At some point, there was a commotion outside, someone with actual visible injuries being wheeled in, David assumed, but those in exam room four took little notice. At five to nine, the exam room door opened and the Stone's pediatrician walked in. Dr. John Dalton was a fellow Dan Torrance would have recognized, although not by last name. To Dan, he was just Dr. John, who made the coffee at the Thursday night big book meeting in North Conway. Thank God, Lucy said, thrusting her howling child into the pediatrician's arms. We've been left on our own for hours. I was on my way when I got the message. Dalton hoisted Abra onto his shoulder. Rounds here, then over in Castle Rock. You've heard about what's happened, haven't you? Heard what? David asked. With the door open, he was for the first time consciously aware of a moderate uproar outside. People were talking in loud voices. Some were crying. The nurse who had admitted them walked by, her face red and blotchy, her cheeks wet. She didn't even glance at the screaming infant. A passenger jet hit the World Trade Center, Dalton said, and no one thinks it was an accident. That was American Airlines Flight 11. United Airlines Flight 175 struck the Trade Center's South Tower 17 minutes later at 9.03 a.m. At 9.03, Abra Stone abruptly stopped crying. By 9.04, she was sound asleep.
On their ride back to Aniston, David and Lucy listened to the radio while Abra slept peacefully in her car seat behind them. The news was unbearable, but turning it off was unthinkable, at least until a newscaster announced the names of the airlines and the flight numbers of the aircraft. Two in New York, one near Washington, one cratered in rural Pennsylvania. Then David finally reached over and silenced the flood of disaster. Lucy, I have to tell you something. I dreamed. I know. She spoke in the flat tone of one who has just suffered a shock. So did I. By the time they crossed back into New Hampshire, David had begun to believe there might be something to that call business after all. 10. In a New Jersey town on the west bank of the Hudson River, there's a park named for the town's most famous resident. On a clear day, it offers a perfect view of lower Manhattan. The true knot arrived in Hoboken on September 8th, parking in a private lot which they had four-walled for ten days. Crow Daddy did the deal. Handsome and gregarious, looking about forty, Crow's favorite T-shirt read, I'm a people person. Not that he ever wore a T when negotiating for the true knot, then it was strictly suit and tie. It was what the rubes expected. His straight name was Henry Rothman. He was a Harvard-educated lawyer, class of 38 and he always carried cash. The true had over a billion dollars in various accounts across the world, some in gold, some in diamonds, some in rare books, stamps, and paintings, but never paid by check or credit card. Everyone, even P and Pod, who looked like kids, carried a roll of tens and twenties. As Jimmy Numbers had once said, We're a cash-and-carry outfit, we pay cash and the rubes carry us. Jimmy was the true's accountant. In his rube days, he had once ridden with an outfit that became known long after their war was over as Quantrill's Raiders. Back then, he had been a wild kid who wore a buffalo coat and carried a sharps, but in the years since, he had mellowed. These days, he had a framed, autographed picture of Ronald Reagan in his RV. On the morning of September 11th, the true watched the attacks on the Twin Towers from the parking lot, passing around four pairs of binoculars. They would have had a better view from Sinatra Park, but Rose didn't need to tell them that gathering early might attract suspicion. And in the months and years ahead, America was going to be a very suspicious nation. If you see something, say something. Around ten that morning... When crowds had gathered all along the river bank and it was safe, they made their way to the park. The little twins, P and Pod, pushed Grandpa Flick in his wheelchair. Grandpa wore his cap stating, I am a vet. His long, baby-fine white hair floated around the cap's edges like milkweed. There had been a time when he'd told folks he was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. Then it was World War I. Nowadays, it was World War II. In another twenty years or so, he expected to switch his story to Vietnam. Verisimilitude had never been a problem. Grandpa was a military history buff. Sinatra Park was jammed. Most folks were silent, but some wept. Apron Annie and Black-Eyed Sue helped in this respect. Both were able to cry on demand. The others put on suitable expressions of sorrow, solemnity, and amazement. Basically, the true knot fit right in. It was how they rolled. Spectators came and went, but the true stayed for most of the day, which was cloudless and beautiful, except for the thick billows of dreck rising in lower Manhattan, that is. They stood at the iron rail, not talking among themselves, just watching, and taking long, slow, deep breaths like tourists from the Midwest standing for the first time on Pemaquid Point or Quaddy Head in Maine, breathing deep of the fresh sea air. As a sign of respect, Rose took off her top hat and held it by her side. At four o'clock, they trooped back to their encampment in the parking lot 
invigorated. They would return the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. They would return until the good steam was exhausted, and then they would move on again. By then, Grandpa Flick's white hair would have become iron gray, and he would no longer need the wheelchair. Chapter 3 Spoons 1. It was a twenty-mile drive from Fraser to North Conway, but Dan Torrance made it every Thursday night, partly because he could. He was now working at Helen Rivington House, making a decent salary, and he had his driver's license back. The car he'd bought to go with it wasn't much, just a three-year-old Caprice with black wall tires and an iffy radio, but the engine was good, and every time he started it up, he felt like the luckiest man in New Hampshire. He thought if he never had to ride another bus, he could die happy. It was January of 2004. Except for a few random thoughts and images, plus the extra work he sometimes did at the hospice, of course, the Shining had been quiet. He would have done that volunteer work in any case, but after his time in AA, he also saw it as making amends, which recovering people considered almost as important as staying away from the first drink. If he could manage to keep the plug in the jug another three months, he would be able to celebrate three years sober. Driving, again, figured large in the daily gratitude meditations upon which Casey Kay insisted, because, he said, and with all the dour certainty of the program long-timer, a grateful alcoholic doesn't get drunk. But mostly Dan went on Thursday nights because the big book gathering was soothing. Intimate, really. Some of the open discussion meetings in the area were uncomfortably large, but that was never true on Thursday nights in North Conway. There was an old AA saying that went, If you want to hide something from an alcoholic, stick it in the big book. And attendance at the North Conway Thursday night meeting suggested that there was some truth in it. Even during the weeks between the 4th of July and Labor Day, the height of the tourist season, it was rare to have more than a dozen people in the Amvet's hall when the gavel fell. As a result, Dan had heard things he suspected would never have been spoken aloud in the meetings that drew fifty or even seventy recovering alkies and druggies. In those, speakers had a tendency to take refuge in the platitudes, of which there were hundreds, and avoid the personal. You'd hear, Serenity pays dividends, and You can take my inventory if you're willing to make my amends. But never, I fucked my brother's wife one night when we were both drunk. At the Thursday night we study sobriety meetings, the little enclave read Bill Wilson's big blue how-to manual from cover to cover, each new meeting picking up where the last meeting had left off. When they got to the end of the book, they went back to the doctor's statement and started all over again. Most meetings covered ten pages or so. That took about half an hour. In the remaining half hour, the group was supposed to talk about the material just read. Sometimes they actually did. Quite often, however, the discussion veered off in other directions, like an unruly planchette scurrying around a Ouija board beneath the fingers of neurotic teenagers. Dan remembered a Thursday night meeting he'd attended when he was about eight months sober. The chapter under discussion, To Wives was full of antique assumptions that almost always provoked a hot response from the younger women in the program. They wanted to know why, in the sixty-five years or so since the big book's original publication, no one had ever added a chapter called Two Husbands. When Gemma T., a thirty-something whose only two emotional settings seemed to be angry and profoundly pissed off, raised her hand on that particular night, Dan had expected a fem-lib tirade. Instead, she said, much more quietly than usual, I need to share something. I've been holding on to it ever since I was seventeen. And unless I let go, I'll never be able to stay away from coke and wine. The group waited. I hit a man with my car when I was coming home drunk from a party, Gemma said. This was back in Somerville. I left him lying by the side of the road. I didn't know if he was dead or alive. I still don't. I waited for the cops to come and arrest me, 
but they never did. I got away with it. She had laughed at this the way people do when the joke's an especially good one, then put her head down on the table and burst into sobs so deep that they shook her rail-thin body. It had been Dan's first experience with how terrifying honesty in all our affairs could be when it was actually put into practice. He thought, as he still did every so often, of how he had stripped Deanie's wallet of cash and how the little boy had reached for the cocaine on the coffee table. He was a little in awe of Gemma, but that much raw honesty wasn't in him. If it came down to a choice between telling that story and taking a drink, I'd take the drink, no question. Two. Tonight the reading was Gutter Bravado, one of the stories from the section of the big book cheerily titled They Lost Nearly All. The tale followed a pattern with which Dan had become familiar. Good family, church on Sundays, first drink, first binge, business success spoiled by booze, escalating lies, first arrest, broken promises to reform, institutionalization, and the final happy ending. All the stories in the big book had happy endings. That was part of its charm. It was a cold night, but overwarm inside, and Dan was edging into a doze when Dr. John raised his hand and said, I've been lying to my wife about something, and I don't know how to stop. That woke Dan up. He liked DJ a lot. It turned out that John's wife had given him a watch for Christmas, quite an expensive one, and when she had asked him a couple of nights ago why he wasn't wearing it, John said he'd left it at the office. Only it's not there. I looked everywhere, and it's just not. I do a lot of hospital rounds, and if I have to change into scrubs, I use one of the lockers in the doctor's lounge. There are combo locks, but I hardly ever use them because I don't carry much cash and I don't have anything else worth stealing. Except for the watch, I guess. I can't remember taking it off and leaving it in a locker, not at C&H or over in Bridgeton, but I think I must have. It's not the expense. It just brings back a lot of the old stuff from the days when I was drinking myself stupid every night and chipping speed the next morning to get going. They were nodding heads at this, followed by similar stories of guilt-driven deceit. No one gave advice. That was called crosstalk and frowned on. They simply told their tales. John listened with his head down and his hands clasped between his knees. After the basket was passed, we are self-supporting through our own contributions, he thanked everyone for their input. From the look of him, Dan didn't think said input had helped a whole hell of a lot. After the Lord's Prayer, Dan put away the leftover cookies and stacked the group's tattered big books in the cabinet marked for AA use. A few people were still hanging around the butt can outside, the so-called meeting after the meeting, but he and John had the kitchen to themselves. Dan hadn't spoken during the discussion. He was too busy having an interior debate with himself. The shining had been quiet, but that didn't mean it was absent. He knew from his volunteer work that it was actually stronger than it had been since childhood, though now he seemed to have a greater degree of control over it. That made it less frightening and more useful. His co-workers at Rivington House knew he had something, but most of them called it empathy and let it go at that. The last thing he wanted now that his life had begun to settle down was to get a reputation as some sort of parlor psychic. Best to keep the freaky shit to himself. Dr. John was a good guy, though, and he was hurting. DJ placed the coffee urn upside down in the dish drainer, used a length of towel hanging from the stove handle to dry his hands, then turned to Dan, offering a smile that looked as real as the coffee mate Dan had stored away next to the cookies in the sugar bowl. Well, I'm off. See you next week, I guess. In the end, the decision made itself. Dan simply could not let the guy go looking like that. He held his arms out. Give it up. The fabled AA man hug. Dan had seen many, but never given a single one. 
John looked dubious for a moment, then stepped forward. Dan drew him in, thinking, there'll probably be nothing. But there was. It came as quickly as it had when, as a child, he had sometimes helped his mother and father find lost things. Listen to me, Doc, he said, letting John go. You were worried about the kid with the Goochers. John stepped back. What are you talking about? I'm not saying it right. I know that. Goochers? Glutchers? It's some sort of bone thing. John's mouth dropped open. Are you talking about Norman Lloyd? You tell me. Normie's got Gaucher's disease. It's a lipid disorder. Hereditary and very rare. Causes an enlarged spleen, neurological disorders, and usually an early unpleasant death. Poor kid's basically got a glass skeleton, and he'll probably die before he's ten. But how do you know that? From his parents. The Lloyds live way the hell down in Nashua. You were worried about talking to him. The terminal ones drive you crazy. That's why you stopped in the Tigger bathroom to wash your hands, even though your hands didn't need washing. You took off your watch and put it up on the shelf where they keep that dark red disinfectant shit that comes in the plastic squeeze bottles. I don't know the name. John D. was staring at him as though he had gone mad. Which hospital is this kid in? Dan asked. Elliot. The time frame's about right, and I did stop in the bathroom near the Peds nursing station to wash my hands. He paused, frowning. And yeah, I guess there are Milne characters on the wall in that one. But if I'd taken off my watch, I'd remem- He trailed off. You do remember, Dan said and smiled. Now you do, don't you? John said, I checked the Elliot lost and found. Bridgeton and C&H, too, for that matter. Nothing. Okay, so maybe somebody came along, saw it, and stole it. If so, you're shit out of luck. But at least you can tell your wife what happened and why it happened. You were thinking about the kid, worrying about the kid, and you forgot to put your watch back on before you left the can. Simple as that. And hey, maybe it's still there. That's a high shelf and hardly anybody uses what's in those plastic bottles because there's a soap dispenser right beside the sink. It's betadine on that shelf, John said, and up high so the kids can't reach it. I never noticed, but... Dan, have you ever been in Elliot? This wasn't a question he wanted to answer. Just check the shelf, Doc. Maybe you'll get lucky. Three. Dan arrived early at the following Thursday's We Study Sobriety meeting. If Dr. John had decided to trash his marriage and possibly his career over a missing $700 watch, Alkies routinely trashed marriages and careers over far less, someone would have to make the coffee. But John was there. So was the watch. This time, it was John who initiated the man hug. An extremely hearty one. Dan almost expected to receive a pair of Gallic kisses on the cheeks before DJ let him go. It was right where you said it would be. Ten days and still there. It's like a miracle. Nah, Dan said. Most people rarely look above their own eye line. It's a proven fact. How did you know? Dan shook his head. I can't explain it. Sometimes I just do. How can I thank you? This was the question Dan had been waiting and hoping for. By working the twelfth step, Dummix. John D. raised his eyebrows. Anonymity. In words of one syllable, keep your fucking mouth shut. Understanding broke on John's face. He grinned. I can do that. Good. Now make the coffee. I'll put out the books. Four. In most New England AA groups, anniversaries are called birthdays and celebrated with a cake and an after-meeting party. Shortly before Dan was due to celebrate his third year of sobriety in this fashion, David Stone and Abra's great-grandmother came to see John Dalton, known in some circles as either Dr. John or DJ, 
and invite him to another third birthday party. This was the one the stones were throwing for Abra. That's very kind, John said, and I'll be more than happy to drop by if I can. Only, why do I feel there's a little more to it? Because there is, Cheddar said, and Mr. Stubborn here has decided that it's finally time to talk about it. Is there a problem with Abra? If there is, fill me in. Based on her last checkup, she's fine. Fearsomely bright. Social skills, terrific. Verbal skills through the roof. Reading ditto. Last time she was here, she read me alligators all around. Probably wrote memory, but still remarkable for a child who's not yet three. Does Lucy know you're here? Lucy and Chetta are the ones who ganged up on me, David said. Lucy's home with Abra making cupcakes for the party. When I left, the kitchen looked like hell in a high wind. So what are we saying here? That you want me at her party in an observational capacity? That's right, Conchetta said. None of us can say for sure that something will happen, but it's more likely to when she's excited, and she's very excited about her party. All her little pals from daycare are coming, and there's going to be a fellow who does magic tricks. John opened a desk drawer and took out a yellow legal pad. What kind of something are you expecting? David hesitated. That's hard to say. Chetta turned to face him. Go on, Carl. Too late to back out now. Her tone was light, almost gay, but John Dalton thought she looked worried. He thought they both did. Begin with the night she started crying and wouldn't stop. Five. David Stone had been teaching American history and 20th century European history to undergraduates for ten years and knew how to organize a story so the interior logic was hard to miss. He began this one by pointing out that their infant daughter's marathon crying spree had ended almost immediately after the second jetliner had struck the World Trade Center. Then he doubled back to the dreams in which his wife had seen the American Airlines flight number on Abra's chest and he had seen the United Airlines number. In Lucy's dream, she found Abra in an airplane bathroom. In mine, I found her in a mall that was on fire. Draw your own conclusions about that part. Or not. To me, those flight numbers seem pretty conclusive, but of what, I don't know. He laughed without much humor, raised his hands, then dropped them again. Maybe I'm afraid to know. John Dalton remembered the morning of 9-11 and Abra's non-stop crying jag very well. Let me get this straight. You believe your daughter, who was then only five months old, had a premonition of those attacks and somehow sent word to you telepathically? Yes, Chetta said. Put very succinctly. Bravo. I know how it sounds, David said, which is why Lucy and I kept it to ourselves. Except for Chetta, that is. Lucy told her that night. Lucy tells her Momo everything. He sighed. Conchetta gave him a cool look. You didn't get one of these dreams? John asked her. She shook her head. I was in Boston. Out of her, I don't know, transmitting range? It's been almost three years since 9-11, John said. I assume other stuff has happened since then. A lot of other stuff had happened, and now that he had managed to speak of the first and most unbelievable thing, Dave found himself able to talk about the rest easily enough. The piano. That was next. You know Lucy plays? John shook his head. Well, she does. Since she was in grammar school. She's not great or anything, but she's pretty good. We've got a Vogel that my parents gave her as a wedding present. It's in the living room, which is also where Abra's playpen used to be. Well, one of the presents I gave Lucy for Christmas in 2001 was a book of Beatles tunes arranged for piano. Abra used to lie in her playpen, goofing with her toys and listening. You could tell by the way she smiled and kicked her feet that she liked the music. John didn't question this. Most babies loved music, and they had their ways of letting you know. The book had all the hits, 
Hey Jude, Lady Madonna, Let It Be, but the one Abra liked best was one of the minor songs, a B-side called Not a Second Time. Do you know it? Not offhand, John said. I might if I heard it. It's upbeat, but unlike most of the Beatles' fast stuff, it's built around a piano riff rather than the usual guitar sound. It isn't a boogie-woogie, but close. Abra loved it. She wouldn't just kick her feet when Lucy played that one. She'd actually bicycle them. Dave smiled at the memory of Abra on her back in her bright purple onesie, not yet able to walk but crib dancing like a disco queen. The instrumental break is almost all piano, and it's simple as pie. The left hand just picks out the notes. There are only twenty-nine, I counted. A kid could play it, and our kid did. John raised his eyebrows until they almost met his hairline. It started in the spring of 2002. Lucy and I were in bed, reading. The weather report was on TV, and that comes about halfway through the 11 p.m. newscast. Abra was in her room, fast asleep, as far as we knew. Lucy asked me to turn off the TV because she wanted to go to sleep. I clicked the remote and that's when we heard it. The piano break of Not a Second Time. Those twenty-nine notes. Perfect. Not a single miss. And coming from downstairs. Doc, we were scared shitless. We thought we had an intruder in the house, only what kind of burglar stops to play a little Beatles before grabbing the silverware? I don't have a gun, and my golf clubs were in the garage, so I just picked up the biggest book I could find and went down to confront whoever was there. Pretty stupid, I know. I told Lucy to grab the phone and dial 911 if I yelled, but there was no one, and all the doors were locked. Also, the cover was down over the piano keys. I went back upstairs and told Lucy I hadn't found anything or anyone. We went down the hall to check the baby. We didn't talk about it, we just did it. I think we knew it was Abra, but neither of us wanted to say it right out loud. She was awake, just lying there in her crib and looking at us. You know the wise little eyes that they have? John knew, as if they could tell you all the secrets of the universe, if they were only able to talk. There were times when he thought that might even be so. Only God had arranged things in such a way so that by the time they could get beyond Goo Goo Gaga, they had forgotten it all, the way we forget even our most vivid dreams a couple of hours after waking. She smiled when she saw us, closed her eyes, and dropped off. The next night it happened again. Same time. Those twenty-nine notes from the living room. Then silence. Then down to Abra's room and finding her awake. Not fussing, not even sucking her bink, just looking at us through the bars of her crib, then off to sleep. This is the truth, John said, not really questioning, only wanting to get it straight. You're not pulling my leg. David didn't smile, not even twitching the cuff of your pants. John turned to Chetta. Have you heard it yourself? No. Let David finish. We got a couple of nights off, and you know how you say that the secret of successful parenting is always make a plan? Sure. This was John Dalton's chief sermon to new parents. How are you going to handle night feedings? Draw up a schedule so someone's always on call and no one gets too ragged. How are you going to handle bathing and feeding and dressing and playtime so the kid has a regular and hence comforting routine? Draw up a schedule, make a plan. Do you know how to handle an emergency? Anything from a collapsed crib to a choking incident? If you make a plan, you will. And nineteen times out of twenty, things will turn out fine. So that's what we did. For the next three nights, I slept on the sofa right across from the piano. On the third night, the music started just as I was snugging down for the night. The cover on the Vogel was closed, so I hustled over and raised it. The keys weren't moving, which didn't surprise me much because I could tell the music wasn't coming from the piano. Beg pardon? 
It was coming from above it, from thin air. By then, Lucy was in Abra's room. The other times we hadn't said anything. We were too stunned. But this time she was ready. She told Abra to play it again. There was a little pause, and then she did. I was standing so close I almost could have snatched those notes out of the air. Silence in John Dalton's office. He had stopped writing on the pad. Chetta was looking at him gravely. At last he said, Is this still going on? No. Lucy took Abra on her lap and told her not to play any more at night because we couldn't sleep. And that was the end of it. He paused to consider. Almost the end. Once, about three weeks later, we heard the music again, but very soft and coming from upstairs this time, from her room. She was playing to herself, Conchetta said. She woke up. She couldn't get back to sleep right away, so she played herself a little lullaby. Six. One Monday afternoon, just about a year after the fall of the Twin Towers, Abra, walking by now and with recognizable words beginning to emerge from her all but constant gabble, teetered her way to the front door and plopped down there with her favorite doll in her lap. What you doing, sweetheart? Lucy asked. She was sitting at the piano playing a Scott Joplin rag. Dada, Abra announced. Honey, Dada won't be home until supper, Lucy said. But fifteen minutes later, the Acura pulled up the drive and Dave got out hauling his briefcase. There had been a water main break in the building where he taught his Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes and everything had been canceled. Lucy told me about that, Conchetta said. And, of course, I already knew about the 9-11 crying jag in the phantom piano. I took a run up there a week or two later. I told Lucy not to say a word to Abra about my visit, but Abra knew. She planted herself in front of the door ten minutes before I showed up. When Lucy asked who was coming, Abra said, Momo. She does that a lot, David said. Not every time someone's coming, but if it's someone she knows and likes... Almost always. In the late spring of 2003, Lucy found her daughter in their bedroom, tugging at the second drawer of Lucy's dresser. Mun, she told her mother. Mun, mun. I don't get you, sweetie, Lucy said. But you can look in the drawer if you want to. It's just some old underwear and leftover cosmetics. But Abra had no interest in the drawer, it seemed didn't even look in it when Lucy pulled it out to show her what was inside. Hind! Mun! Then drawing a deep breath. Mun! Hind! Mama! Parents never become absolutely fluent in baby. There's not enough time, but most learn to speak it to some degree, and Lucy finally understood that her daughter's interest wasn't in the contents of the dresser, but in something behind it. Curious... She pulled it out. Abra darted into the space immediately. Lucy, thinking that it would be dusty in there even if there weren't bugs or mice, made a swipe for the back of the baby's shirt and missed. By the time she got the dresser out far enough to slip into the gap herself, Abra was holding up a twenty-dollar bill that had found its way through the hole between the dresser's surface and the bottom of the mirror. Look, she said gleefully, Mun! My Mun! Nope, Lucy said, plucking it out of the small fist. Babies don't get mun because they don't need mun. But you did just earn yourself an ice cream cone. Ikeem, Abra shouted. My Ikeem. Now tell Dr. John about Mrs. Judkins, David said. You were there for that? Indeed I was, Conchetta said. That was some Fourth of July weekend. By the summer of 2003, Abra had begun speaking in more or less full sentences. Conchetta had come to spend the holiday weekend with the Stones. On the Sunday, which happened to be July 6th, Dave had gone to the 7-Eleven to buy a fresh canister of Blue Rhino for the backyard barbecue. Abra was playing with blocks in the living room. Lucy and Chetta were in the kitchen, one of them checking periodically on Abra to make sure she hadn't decided to 
pull out the plug on the TV and chew it or go climbing Mount Sofa. But Abra showed no interest in those things. She was busy constructing what looked like a stone hinge made out of her plastic toddler blocks. Lucy and Chetta were unloading the dishwasher when Abra began to scream. She sounded like she was dying, Chetta said. You know how scary that is, right? John nodded. He knew. Running doesn't come naturally to me at my age, but I ran like Wilma Rudolph that day. Beat Lucy to the living room by half a length. I was so convinced the kid was hurt that for a second or two I actually saw blood. But she was okay. Physically, anyhow. She ran to me and threw her arms around my legs. I picked her up. Lucy was with me by then, and we managed to get her soothed a little. Wani, she said. Help Wani, Momo. Wani, fall down. I didn't know who Wani was, but Lucy did. Wanda Judkins, the lady across the street. She's Abra's favorite neighbor, David said, because she makes cookies and usually brings one over for Abra with her name written on it, sometimes in raisins, sometimes in frosting. She's a widow, lives alone. So we went across, Chetta resumed. Me in the lead and Lucy holding Abra. I knocked. No one answered. Wani in the dinner room, Abra said. Help Wani, Momo. Help Wani, Mama. She hurted herself and blood is coming out. The door was unlocked. We went in. First thing I smelled was burning cookies. Mrs. Judkins was lying on the dining room floor next to a stepladder. The rag she'd been using to dust out the moldings was still in her hand, but there was blood, all right, a puddle of it around her head in a kind of halo. I thought she was finished. I couldn't see her breathing, but Lucy found a pulse. The fall fractured her skull, and there was a small brain bleed, but she woke up the next day. She'll be at Abra's birthday party. You can say hello to her if you come. She looked at Abra Stone's pediatrician unflinchingly. The doctor at the ER said that if she'd lain there much longer, she would have either died or ended up in a persistent vegetative state. Far worse than death, in my humble opinion. Either way, the kid saved her life. John tossed his pin on top of the legal pad. I don't know what to say. There's more, Dave said but the other stuff's hard to quantify. Maybe just because Lucy and I have gotten used to it. The way I guess you'd get used to living with a kid who was born blind. Except this is almost the opposite of that. I think we knew even before the 9-11 thing. I think we knew there was something almost from the time we brought her home from the hospital. It's like... He huffed out a breath and looked at the ceiling as if for inspiration. Conchetta squeezed his arm. Go on. At least he hasn't called for the men with the butterfly nuts yet. Okay. It's like there's always a wind blowing through the house, only you can't exactly feel it or see what it's doing. I keep thinking the curtains are going to billow and the pictures are going to fly off the walls, but they never do. Other stuff does happen, though. Two or three times a week... Sometimes two or three times a day, the circuit breakers trip. We've had two different electricians out on four different occasions. They check the circuits and tell us everything is hunky-dory. Some mornings we come downstairs and the cushions from the chairs and the sofa are on the floor. We tell Abra to put her toys away before bed, and unless she's overtired and cranky, she's very good about it but sometimes the toy box will be open the next morning and some of the toys will be back on the floor. Usually the blocks. They're her favorite.